Is that is it is it recording? Yeah. Hello everybody <laughs> and welcome to Leicester Gallery Open Talks at De Montfort University and um, in, in Leicester. And we've got fine art students and photography and video and lots of students and and members of the public uh, and it's a very very special occasion because we have a wonderful artist Trevor Burgess who's um, come to talk about his new show that he's got um, and now Trevor's a very interesting artist because he actually started um, studying a literature he did a degree in literature and then he uh, worked as an assistant curator and then decided to do art and he did an MA in art is that right Yes, yes. Um, so I, this is yes, it's interesting, the, the different a way that you've approached it. And, and now um, what I find fascinating about your practice is that you combine curating and art and you're an artist and curator. So, um, so we often we've had curators on this talk and we had artists and now we've got an artist curator. <laughs> um, so it's very interesting. Yes, and I think of myself very much as it's an art, as an artist curator in the sense that the things that I'm interested in when I'm curating a show um, really relates to my own practice. I'm not I'm not in, very interested in curating shows just for the sake of curating. They're generally related to things that I'm interested in in my own painting. Yeah, well, that's um, really great for us. Um, so um, I hope you've all got yourselves muted. And what we'll do is uh, Trevor's going to talk about his work and his new shows coming up. You've got a show coming up in January in Sheffield um, and then a show touring. Um, so I'll, I'll let you describe them more because they're group shows, aren't they? And, um, and yes. so, yeah. So do you want to start by sharing? Um, yes. So hello everybody and thank you very much for coming. Um, it's nice to see you all here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you and uh, go to, here we go. Sorry, I'm, I, I'm relatively new to using Teams, so please everybody bear with me a little bit, um, but. You're doing well. <laughs> Here we go. Right. Yes. So, um, yes, as as Lala said, just um, briefly, I I did actually study literature and where but I used to I couldn't really I was painting from very, very young and I even while I was studying literature, I found myself um, doing life drawing classes all through um, my degree and still painting. And as soon as I finished, I went straight back to painting. It was one of the, I don't know, I just couldn't really get away from it. And then I ended up, and one of my first jobs was working as assistant curator at the Norwich Gallery at Norwich School of Art. And um, that gave me a really extraordinary sort of opened out my world, really. I was working with a woman called Linda Morris, who was the curator there. And that opened up a whole world of contemporary art to me, and also the whole process of putting shows together. I set up an artist studios in um, Norwich, which um, went, ran as a co artist cooperative for seven years. And at, um, after putting a lot of time and energy into that, and, and really decided I ought to um, study art properly. Um, and I did a one year MA at Winchester School of Art, which was um, the course was based in Barcelona. And so it got me um, out of the country and got me a whole year of um, studying European fine art. It was called it was, um, and painting. Uh, and then following that, I came to London and that was really where my current um, working practice really sort of started um, because I started painting things around me um, in London. I was living in Hackney and making started making paintings from snapshots of what I was seeing in the streets around me. And that that was really in many ways the sort of foundation of what I've been doing ever since ever since then. But I want to start the talk with a couple of thoughts 
um, before we um, come on to a bit more detail. Um, one of the things um, I put at the when I was going um, asked to just summarize what I was going to talk about um, is a quote from Plato, Greek philosopher, who said, a thing is not seen because it is visible. On the contrary, it is visible because it is seen. And you get your head around that one. What he's saying, I think, is something that's really fundamental to the process of making painting or drawing, that seeing is a process of making visible. And we don't always, when we look at things, you can say we looked, but we didn't necessarily see it. And the longer you spend in the process of making drawings or paintings, the more things become visible to you. And so what Plato says about things becoming visible is not necessarily the case that just because we look around us, we necessarily see very deeply. And one of the things that's always fascinating about the process of painting is it's a slow process in which things become visible through the process of doing it. And so that's always been um, something that I've have found sort of a really fascinated me about pro the process of painting. And then the second thing is that that applies to the process of viewing paintings. The paintings give attention to things. And so they make things visible to a viewer. And at the most basic level, we probably wouldn't look at water lilies in the same way, but Monet made the water lilies visible to us. And then if you look at it more politically, some the things that artists have chosen to paint and now um, there's a, a lot of recognition that, for example, we haven't seen women's approaches to painting. We've got issues around um, subject matter in painting, issues, issues around what was depicted, um, colonial history and these things. And they're all to do with what is made visible by being put into paintings. So paintings have this quite important role of making things visible. And that's really so in my own my own work, I I I start with what's around me. And I've been very interested in underlooked, underregarded aspects of urban life, people in social uses of a, urban space, people in urban space. And that's been something that's been making things visible that don't necessarily very often get get into paintings. Um, and then the second thing as a theme before I before I talk in a little bit more detail about this specific exhibition is that it always fascinated me what's something very particular to painting as a practice is that there is a gap in painting between between what a painting depicts and what um, and how it's depicted. And what's there's always, when you look at a painting, there's always this space, and it's a subjective space between what you see when you enter imaginatively into the world of the painting and the surface, the, the, the paint, the, the whole material surface of the painting. And <clears throat> one of the things when I started doing the paintings we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about today, this exhibition of inverse colour paintings, is that when I, these are paintings in which I started by inverting the colour that we see. And so all, all the paintings we're going to see in this particular um, series of work have that as a starting point. And this, this one that you can see on the screen now, um, the colours, um, it's, it's something you can do very simply digitally. There's an invert colour function on Photoshop that just does does this. But what it does, of course, it converts orange into blue. It converts um, green into red, the, the opposite colours, and it converts lights into darks and darks into light and vice versa. So, um, and I, I just became fascinated by what happens in that process, how suddenly what your painting gets pulled apart from the starting point, what's being depicted and the implications of that. And um, I'll talk a little bit about why and how I came to start doing this. Um, but that's that's really 
um, behind the exhibition that I'm going to talk about today. Lala also mentioned that as an artist curator, um, I have um, put together exhibitions and curated exhibitions. And um, there's one that's um, opening at the Millennium Gallery in Sheffield in January, it runs from January till June, so not too far away for people um, based in Leicester to get to if you get the opportunity, um, which is called Where We Live. And that's, an, that's a show of five artists. Um, it's myself, an artist called Jonathan Hooper, who's based in Leeds, um, Judy Tucker, who's also based in Leeds, but has been painting uh, chalets on the Lincolnshire coast, one of the few places in the country where people actually build their own um, houses. Um, Narby Price, who's based um, up in Northumberland, and Newcastle, and he's been painting a mine, an ex mining village um, in Northumberland. And Mandy Payne, who's based in Sheffield, um, who's been painting brutalist housing estate in Sheffield. And um, this show came out of a series of paintings I was doing called A Place to Live, which were looking at houses in London. And I'd been painting in a, these paintings as a series. So there's actually um, just over 60 of them. And I wanted to show them all together. And I was looking at other artists who'd been doing similar things, giving intense attention to one place um, and painting that in a series of paintings. So if you get to see the exhibition, you'll see it presents a whole cluster of works about one place, about this mining village um, in Northumberland, Ashington, about this place on the Lincolnshire coast, about this housing estate, um, Park Hill in Sheffield, about residential housing in Leeds, that's Jonathan's work, and about um, housing in London, which um, I've been painting. And so that 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 just gives an idea of sort of how I go, how I've been going about curating with the starting point being areas that I've been interested in, working in a series about a specific place and then looking for ways um, of drawing parallels and drawing connections and relationships. And we've done, um, an artist, we did an artist discussion panel um, when the show launched at the Alan Baxton Gallery in London in the autumn. And we were all of us quite, I mean, thrilled really, I think, um, that how much when we each came to talk about our work, how, mu how much it drew out different connections and different ways of looking at the work when you see different work in juxtaposition and when we had the opportunity to share um, practice. And I think the process of curating as well has been a way of keeping me in touch with the practice of other artists because um, I was based in a studio group, as I said, um, for a period earlier in my career, but I now work in my own studio and and I'm not attached to any institution. I'm not attached to an art school. And so it's been a way for me of keeping myself um, in in relationship with practice of other artists who I feel have shared concerns with. Um, and um, it, it's it's a way of making as um, getting that dialogue, I suppose. I did I did another exhibition which was exactly about that process. It was about artist dialogue and that exhibition put together two artists in conversation and we did a little catalogue and we chose each chose one painting of of the artist we were paired with and then talked about and wrote about that and had a dialogue about it. So the exhibition showed four paintings by each pair of artists where there'd been this relationship of um, responding to each other's work and entering into a dialogue about it. Um, so those those are some of the things that feed into the process of curating shows. I'll now come on to this this exhibition, the Inverse Colour exhibition. And this exhibition started like this, um, an empty space. My brother runs a record shop in North London and he rang me up in May this year and said he's opening, he's moving to a new space 
and he's got it for about a month before he can actually do the shop fit out. And this was a space and he thought it would be a great space to do a pop up exhibition. And I went along and looked at it and it's it was a very nice space um, to use. So we had about six weeks to get an exhibition together and this was just happening at the end of the lock at the end of the lockdown. Um, and I'd been in a position over 18 months, quite frustrated, really, because I had a number of exhibitions, including the one, the Where We Live one that I was just talking about, all set up, ready to go. And then, of course, everything closed down and you couldn't exhibit. And also during lockdown, I'd been doing this new series of paintings, which I'd never, sh I hadn't shown at all I had a chance to show, and I wanted to test them out. And it just happened that the date that we opened the show to ended up being literally the first day you were able the they relaxed the rules sufficiently for you, you to have a big group gathering. We did a little private opening on the Friday night where we were able to invite a few people. But on the Monday night, we could launch the show with a proper private view. So the timing was beautiful. And the paintings, as you'll see, were really very directly related to what um, we'd all been experiencing and what I'd been experiencing through the pandemic. Um, so um, to, we got the publicity into action. I, my brother um, was able to publicise it through his um, his um, business. He runs secondhand record shops, and so he had an audience and some and a member of staff who could help to promote it. And for me, doing something like a pop up exhibition, it was really important. I have my audience and every time I do a show, I, um, people from my audience will will come along. And so when I'm looking for places to do a show, I'm always looking for somewhere where it's like other people will get to see it. I'll reach a new audience. And so through this, um, it was based in Crouch End. And when I was um, in the gallery, People were coming in and saying, hey, you opening a gallery in Crouch End because Crouch End, I don't know people who don't know London, is is quite a nice, a nice bit of North London. It's um, it's quite known for its music scene um, and there's a good um, and it's 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 got a it's a sort of quite place people like to live. It's got its own sort of character and you, you would expect some sort of art scene to be going on there and they do have some things and they are actually opening gallery and um, there in the next year or so but there was literally no no there's one small gallery there but there's nothing very much in crouch end so people so that was and we were on the high street so people were coming in um and seeing it and so i got a real a very a really good response to the show and a lot of people coming in so this was this was the poster that we designed um for it and then seeing how that I'll get rid of that I can't, no. um, and then i also did an instagram campaign so i did and on instagram you have to keep on coming up with feeding feeding it with images so i came up with a series of square format and i really like doing these because it was going to be a record shop and this, the Instagram format is exactly the same shape as a vinyl record cover. So I had in mind that they're, they're sort of a little bit like record covers, the um, publicity things I did for it. And so I used a series of variations on the paintings in the show using um, a colour for the title and then the reverse colour um, for, for my name. And so there's a whole series here and then there's the flashback logo because they were um, hosting the show um, that we did. So there were a whole series of variations, which I really quite enjoyed doing, which we then were able to put out one day after day on Instagram of the exhibition. And also um, they they wanted, they had some scaffolding up, which was really annoying and it was meant to be coming down and it didn't come down in the end. Um, the builders just didn't get rid of the scaffolding in time. So we had to live with that. So we, we commissioned a banner and we had a banner on the shop. So it was it was literally on a parade of shops. So there was a, 
a lot of footfall, a lot of people walking past, which was great. And then people going by on the bus could see this banner, which we tied up on the scaffolding. And so that gave also the show quite a bit of presence. Um, and so these are all sort of things that you have to think about, quite aside from making the work when you're doing something like a pop up exhibition. Um, and then there was a whole issue of invigilating it. And so you I only wanted to do it for a short amount of time because I either had to get somebody to sit in or I had to sit in myself for it. And then having been in lockdown for 18 months, I actually quite enjoyed the process of sit, sitting in the gallery and getting very direct response to to the exhibition. Um, so um, here we are. This is what it looked like. And I want to show you this because this is a real show in real. This was the real show. Um, and this these are the paintings and I'm going I'm going to be presenting to you shortly this show, which is now in an online gallery and being presented in a virtual space, which has a tremendous advantage in that we can all go and see it now and people all over the world can go and see it, which is fantastic. Um, but of course, it's not getting the direct experience of actually seeing and experiencing the paintings themselves. Um, and so um, I wanted to show you that and things. Uh, I mean, one of the things as well was that you'll notice the sort of lighting in this space was it wasn't ideal. It was a pop up show. And so getting getting shots of it. The virtual gallery has the advantage that it's beautifully lit. And so the paintings are, are nicely lit in that way. But you have to work with all these physical things um, in in a real space. Um, and then we're, this is the opening. So we're actually all able to gather together and actually have an opening with real people seeing the show, which was um, just a really nice thing to be able to do after such a long period of no. That's my sister, everybody. Oh, yes, that is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> this one's my sister. <laughs> oh. Yeah, well, yeah, I had to put had to put her in there. <laughs> um, OK, and then I also gave a, um, I gave a talk. Um, so what, the other thing thinking about when you're putting a show together is um, having points in the show where people will will come along in London. In London, there's so many shows go on. Getting an audience for people to actually see it um, is quite it can be quite hard work um, because there's so many other things for them to do. And um, one of the ways it, to do that is to have specific events during the show. So there's a sort of focal point and people think, right, I'll come along to that. Um, and so um, we did we did the opening and then we did on the closing day, we did a we did a talk. I did a talk about the show uh, on the last day, um, which also got a, a nice audience um, to go to. Uh, OK, I think at this point I shall then switch to looking at the. Um, the online exhibition, which is being presented. At the Kato Wong Gallery. So Kato came to see the see the um, physical show and then he offered me to do an online exhibition. And so these are the paintings now. Uh, I can we, you, we can get a little view of the paintings in an online space. So I'm just doing this with my mouse and you can do the same if you come and visit it. So you can see it's shared with another artist called Kai Bellis, who's been painting the London club scene. So in the second room there, you can see Kai Bellis's paintings as well. But I'm just going to focus today, if you don't mind, on mine. And these, this gives you an overview of the exhibition and a sense of the size and number of paintings in the exhibition. And then I'll give you a little tour and we can go around the paintings uh, one by one. You can see there that's the one that was on on the poster. And this one I'll come back to later is. So there we are, that's an overview of the show. And I'll take you straight in now. To the first painting.
Uh, the this painting um, is was done the day after the Brexit referendum in 2016, and it was a real shock to me the result of the referendum. And um, there was a number of ways in which I knew that um, coming out of the European Union was going to make a significant impact on my life. I, I actually work on European Union projects, so it was affecting my work life. And through that, I had a lot of partners in other European countries who have worked with on creative and cultural projects. And I was actually in Brussels, would you believe, on the day of the vote. And um, we were having a talk by a German MEP that was quite inspiring about how the European Union was recognising that culture is a central part of European policy and needs to be at the heart of um, the way the European Union is developing. And so we went from that inspiring speech um, to waking up the next morning at six o'clock to hear um, the result of the referendum. And I went home thinking, I don't know how I'm going to, I was in deep shock about it. I really, I'd sort of seen it might be coming, but I really hadn't expected um, that it would, people would actually um, vote to come out. And so I, the next day I thought, processing things, I'm going to make a painting. And this idea I'd had in the back of my mind, an idea about inverting colour, um, from what I'd said earlier about this thing about there being gap, a gap in painting and exposing the gap between um, what's in the painting and the surface of the painting. And so I ended up painting this painting and it's, it brings together the personal and the political because it's an image of a place where I have family connections. My father was brought up here, it's a place called Berlin Gap and it's the white cliffs that face France on the south coast of England. And these cottages here, we used to go, well, firstly, my father was brought up um, here during the Second World War and he actually evacuated. We, the reason I ended up growing up in Yorkshire was because um, his, his mother evacuated because the German bombers were coming over and the farm next to where they lived right here actually got a direct hit and they said enough's enough and they moved away. So it had these strong connections with a European war uh, in my mind and um, some of the um, terrible things that had happened through the 1930s leading up to that war. It's also a place where an artist friend of mine lives in the, lived in this house here and this is why I have the images of it because we used to go and stay with them there. And there was also an artist um, who's quite a well-known artist called Jean Cook, who was married to the painter John Bratby, um, who um, lived in this end cottage here. So there was a bit of an artist connection as well. But the other thing that's really moved me about this place is that these cliffs are being worn away. And these, there was a much longer line of terraces here, and one by one they've had to be knocked down as the waves erode the cliffs. And this was all deeply metaphorical to me in what was happening and the in, inversion of values that was happening as a result of the Brexit vote. And all these things were mixed up in my head as I made this painting. And you'll see right at the centre of it is the inverted colours of the union, a torn flag of the Union Jack. Um, and I think the painting Inverting the colours gave gave the whole painting quite a feeling of, I don't know, what do you want to call it, doom? Um, so I did that painting, I didn't know what to do next, and it sat there for quite a long time. And the Brexit, whole Brexit crisis just went from bad to worse. And the next one that I ended up doing is this painting. And this is a reworking of a painting by, oh, sorry. Oh, yes. There we go. It's moving on it a bit. Oh, the reworking of a painting by Oskar Kokoschka. Oskar Kokoschka was an Austrian expressionist artist who worked in the 20th century. And 
um, worked and painted and travelled all over Europe and came to see himself, if you like, as a sort of European citizen um, and standing for some of the sort of cultural values of Europe in a way. And one of the things he, he also took a very, he took a strong stand against the rise of fascism and Nazism in the 1930s. And he made a painting of Do this painting of Dover. And Dover, of course, is one of the places in the country that was, is very strongly affected by the, um, the impact of Brexit on trade. And it's the major port where we do our trade with the rest of the rest of Europe. So this was a significant image. And Kokoschka had painted this in the 1920s when he was uh, traveling all over Europe. And then, I mean, there were a lot of parallels. There was an economic crash in 1929. Um, when you think of the stock market crash that we had in 2007, led to um, Kokosh, led to the rise of right-wing movements in, in Europe and the rise of Nazism. Kokoschka found himself living in Prague in 1938 when the Nazis invaded and they'd already designated him a degenerate artist. Um, and suppre um, uh, suppressed his work and clearly he was in great danger. He managed to get out and um, the, this country gave, gave him and his wife refuge. And he was more or less my age when that happened and it completely, um, his life was completely turned upside down uh, by it. So there were a lot, of, a lot of parallels in his life that I was drawing upon when I was making this this painting and it's quite interesting as well his painting um, which I can show you um, later is is possibly not as doom laden he's an ex he's known as an expressionist painter but his painting um, feels if you like a little bit less um, cataclysmic than what happens to it when you reverse the colors as I did here um, I should say the painting itself is exactly the same size as the Kokoschka as, as well. So I was sort of really um, working sort of quite directly from it in that sense. Uh, the next one, if I can move toward it, is, yeah. After, um, I, I made one or two other paintings relating to Brexit, but um, towards then the pandemic began and I started thinking about how inverting colour might relate to things that were happening in relation to the pandemic. And this is a painting after a painting by Titian that's in the National Gallery. And um, it's the painting is called Diana and Actaeon. And it depicts Diana, who was the god of hunting and of chastity, and Actaeon. Now, Titian did a previous painting where Actaeon burst in on Diana as he was hunting in the woods with his dog, and she was naked with her nymphs. And it was a bit unfortunate for Actaeon because she was not amused, and she set his own dogs on him, turned him into a stag, and set his own dogs on him. And Titian, for good measure in this painting, added her into the painting, having a shot at him as well. So this here is Actaeon with a stag's head in the in the process of being transformed with his dogs um, about to tear him to pieces and Diana having a shot at him. And all this, I mean, it's a painting that I love for many reasons and I could talk about it for quite a long time. Um, but one of, one of the things that made me want to rework it was that Titian lived in a time of plague in Venice and it's a very tragic painting and his late paintings at the end of his life have this sense of tragedy because he was surrounded by something similar to the pandemic, people dying all around him. Um, and this painting was, had resonances for me of what was going on with the pandemic because just a casual encounter, Actian stumbles in and meets somebody um, and it really wasn't his fault. And the consequences were his fate or destiny, if you like, 
totally arbitrary, but that was death for Actium. And it just seemed to me that what the whole way that this virus operates, there was something there in that, that um, it's, it's a sort of randomness and arbitrariness of fate. And there's something else that I love about this painting. It, it, it does something of telescoping the perspective. And people would say, when they first looked at my version of it, that it took them a long time looking at it to actually start to recognize what's going on. And even in the original painting, you don't immediately make out Actian over here. Um, you sort of peer into the painting and then you realize he's there. And then you realize his head isn't there. And then you sort of realize, oh my God, that's, his, that's a stag's head, it's not his head. And so you sort of, it's a slow process. And I think there's something in the way Titian is painting it, it's extraordinarily modern, this idea that something is just glimpsed and you don't see it very clearly. And the subject of the painting is death. And death is something we don't really like to look at. And yet we sort of feel compelled to keep coming back and looking at it. And something in this painting sort of psychologically actualizes how we look at that process in a way. And so that sort of that was one of the things that, again, by making the painting less, um, the subject of the painting less clear through the process of the inverse colors, it 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 actualized that process in a way. Um, I don't know how clearly I'm saying that, but hopefully perhaps you can see what I'm getting at. Uh, OK. We're now going to move. Oh, no, we're not. We moved to say, we've, got, we've got about 10 minutes and then yeah. we'll open up to questions or sure. five minutes. <clears throat> OK. Um, now I can. So I'm now going to move around to these paintings, this series of paintings. And this was a series of paintings that I started doing um, when the pandemic struck. They're painted, you can't, you, can't, you can't see so clearly in the virtual gallery, but they're painted on aluminium. And what I started doing was going back to paintings that I'd made of people in urban space in London. When I first came to London, when I started painting people around me in, in the city. And of course, there I was, there we all were stuck at home and it wasn't there anymore. And I didn't feel that I could keep painting these paintings, which were celebrating street life and a street life that had completely disappeared. And again, this sort of little nagging thing of the inverse colour came back to me and I thought, OK, what happens if I just go back to these paintings and invert the colours? And what does happen? It's, it's, it completely changes the atmosphere. And I was wanting also to, there was a lot of, a lot of talk during the pandemic of artists providing um, images to buck up the spirits of the nation, if you like. And I think that's really important and I wouldn't, um, and it's a very important role for artists and it was certainly needed. And, but at the same time, I, I also felt that we need to acknowledge something of the anxiety, something of the disruption, something of the fact that the feeling that everything's changed, that even, even though the street didn't look that different. The feeling we had because of knowing about this virus and knowing about the dangers um, and the way our lives have been disrupted, everything felt different. And so that was something through inverting the colour that I was I was attempting to sort of work with. So I'll quickly run through. There's a series of them. I did a series of street scenes that these are based on. And these are the, the variations on the street scenes. Um, if I can, so you can see them. And you can see that they've become, they've become quite difficult to read and all sorts of interesting things happen in the way that they're, um, they play with our perception, I suppose. So this is, this is another one. 
I'll just take you through them quite quickly. And I was also, I, pa I paint flat, and I've always been interested in things that happen with the paint. And you see in this one um, that there's this sort of feeling of how the paint sort of spilled over um, the image um, with this very wet paint. And I was also struggling to use a new medium. I was trying to make things difficult for myself using um, working on the aluminium, on the shiny aluminium, which doesn't come over so well in the reproductions. So, I, as I say, I'll just run you through them one by one. This one, for me, really had a really strong sense of the sort of anxieties at the time. So that's that's the series of those ones. And then this is um, this is the one that we used for the, the poster. And this one sort of summed up the whole thing for me. I called it Lockdown Blues. And um, the original image was a woman just glimpsed through the windows um, sitting on a platform on the Docklands Light Railway in London. Um, and when I inverted the colour, it just completely sort of transform the emotional sort of resonance of the image and it became a sort of iconic image for me of um, just the feeling of of the lockdown um, in the original image you have to imagine this bright sunshine on this woman sitting there so where all these these dark areas are in the image was dazzling sunshine and of course that's converted into deep shadows um, in when the colours get inverted. Uh, and the same with this, those those dark, dark shadows, of course, were bright, were bright light. Um, and the inversion. Um, it separates out what you know about something from how you respond to it. That's my that's my particular favourite. I like that one. It's the black in the background. It just looks, you know, really apocalyptic or, you know. I know, I know. It's straight. Haunting, it's, you know, it looks like ghost tree and a ghost ghosts and this black background, you know. One of one of the things with doing these as well is that um, when you when you when you're painting images and when you look at old images, old master images and painting images in galleries, it's the darks. I mean, look at Rembrandt or um, Caravaggio or so many painters. It's just the subtlety of tone in the darks that is um, that you really work with. When you turn that around and invert it, I found myself really, really focusing on the subtleties in the lights, in the bright colours in a way that um, is is quite strange. And you're really giving attention to the to the yeah. very colour. Um, as you say, like, and he becomes like ghostly, this figure. Yes. So um, can we open it up to questions? Because we're sure. kind of running. I realise we've you're such a great talker. We could talk, uh, but we've got 15 minutes left and it'd be nice to hear. Yes. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. That one's amazing as well. I mean, I, I've just got to start off with the first question. I just do you, you take the photographs, do you? And then you invert the photograph. Is that your process? And then paint that on a computer screen? Yes, I I take snapshot photographs, which I then paint from. And I, the photographs, uh, like they do the drawing for me, so I don't do any preliminary drawing. What I do is spend a lot of time working out the image from the photograph that I'm going to work from. And then I make the painting. Um, and then when I came to do the inverse colour paintings, where I was working from a painting that I'd done before, I actually went back to the original photograph that I yes. worked on, inverted that photograph, and so did exactly the same process as I'd done originally with the first paintings, but in inverted um, from the inverted photograph. So that's that's the process behind them. And I, then, I, 
I think they should make that Union Jack for, you know, you should always have an inverted Union Jack. I think it's beautiful. I had one, I sold it. I had one in the show. And oh. I, liked it. I called it Flag after Jasper Johns. Ah. John, <laughs> Jasper Johns played around with the American flag. Yes. And, uh, by inverting the colours, I sort of needed to sort of nod a wink to Jasper Johns um, by playing around with the British flag. But I can show you in some of these. Oh, have you got the flag one there? Um, I haven't got the flag one. Oh, but you've got Diana. Oh, that was nice. The, uh, the uh, Titian painting. We, this is this is quite interesting. So here we have. Oh, wow. Oh, um, there. That's an original image that I made a painting from. Yes. That's the photo. So that's the photograph. Yep. And then that's the original painting that I made from the photograph. And as you can see, I took out the woman. And so I'm not I, I'm not necessarily always just um, doing an exact. Doing, yes, doing. I like that without the woman. Wow. So yeah. that so that was the original painting, which I call just waiting. Yes. Then this I then played around on Photoshop a little bit with the original image and inverted it. So I got rid of the figure. And I wow. don't, when you look back, there was this shadow in the original image. And yes. So I try. I retained that. In, yeah. Oops, sorry. Oh, in the uh, inversion one. Yeah. In, so this is the photograph inverted in Photoshop and played around a little, with a little bit. Yeah. And this is the painting that's actually sitting right behind me now as I speak. Oh, um, yes, I see it. Yeah. Wow. That I that I made of it once it's been inverted. So that gives you the process. Yes. Um, so can I um, ask for any questions? Uh, do you want to put your hands up and you can turn your computer screen on or um, are there any questions? You can just ask Trevor anything you like. Come on. OK, Kirsty, turn your camera on. Great. Hi. Um, sorry if there's weird background noise. The kitten's trying to attack the Christmas tree at the moment. <laughs> <so I> apologise. <laughs> um, I'll try not to hog this because I've actually got quite a few questions, but I'll try and keep them uh, simple. Just thinking about your your process when you like with that painting that you've just talked about. Have yeah. you ever re inverted the inverted one? So you turn from your negative painting back into a, a, a positive image because it'd be I think it'd be quite interesting to see what the the painting actually does then to, to the colours and how they shift. Have you ever looked at that? Well, you know what? When people came to the opening, some people had the function on their iPhone uh -huh. that does that. So they would put it they were looking at the painting in front wow. of them and looking at the screen of what it looked like inverted. To be honest I really avoided doing it because yeah, yeah. Um, it would have got in the way of the image. Yeah. I mean, I, what, when you're making a painting, there's always, I mean, from the beginning, but as you go on with a painting, the painting itself asserts what it wants and you need to work with what the painting wants. And so if I'd sort of been constantly thinking this needs to sort of doing this, turning it around and thinking, does it look right? Um, I think I'd have lost the track in trying to paint mm -hmm. it. But yeah. it astonished me when they did this. That, and it's also what astonished me is the people in the paintings came back to life when you saw, and they did look really like people. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and so it was it was quite astonishing to me that suddenly, and that was part of what I was sort of saying in the paintings that we'd lost something through this pandemic in the way we were, we were relating to people. It was like something had been lost and we weren't fully relating. And it became really real because suddenly the people became more alive when you did that, when you did that, even though it was just an inverted image of an inverted painting. It's like, yeah, four yeah. Times to move. But it's interesting. Yeah. And then if, if I can just quickly ask the other question, it was coming back to your curating, actually, and really not just for me, but maybe for some of the other people listening. Um, you talked about sort of keeping this relationship with other artists with similar concerns and all that sort of thing. How 
what would you recommend would be the process to try and create these artist networks? Because obviously it's technically it's easy because we've got online and we've got where do you look for people that aren't really famous? Do you see what I mean? Um, yeah, and I wouldn't worry about whether they're famous or not. I'd say if you respond to somebody's work, um, then try and make the connection to people who's working with them, whether they're famous or not. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that. I was looking back at some notes I made five years ago, six years ago, before I went on to Instagram, and I was saying how difficult it was to connect with other painters, just what you're saying. And I found Instagram really, really good in that way. Um, I found Jonathan Hooper's work on Instagram and I immediately saw the connections with what he was doing with what I was doing. And so I was able to get in touch with him through Instagram and say, can I come up and see your work? And that was the genesis for the um, Where We Live show. I went and did a studio visit. And so, yeah, I mean, and Instagram has put me back in touch with people who I used to know, who I'd lost touch with or whose work I'd, work I'd admired, but never had any connection with. And suddenly it's quite intimate. You like seeing what they're doing every day. You know what they're, they're putting their thoughts up and you get really quite close to people through it. So that's been that's been really helpful. And going going and seeing shows as well um, and meeting meeting just through through that um it's yeah um but i mean for me it's always been about somebody's work who i i can i connect with something about and that uh, you know then there is this what i was saying about having an artist dialogue it's like um there's lots of artists who i, know, I recognize are doing really interesting work but it doesn't connect directly with with me with my concerns so I've I've sort of always on the lookout for the for collaborations with people where I feel a real dialogue's going on with them um, and for me it's around painting as well so I sort of set some sort of boundaries around it if you like um, about sort of what what I'm looking for brilliant lovely thank thanks for that it's really helpful and good luck with the show as well Thank, thank you. Do do get along to it if you can. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Any other questions? We've got a few more minutes. Should we just run through the rest of your slideshow if there are no other questions? Yeah. If anybody wants to put the hand up or type in the chat, feel free. Yeah. You know. this, yeah um, I'll just look at the ch chat a, to check. I'm trying to find this. It now seems to have disappeared. Where has it gone? Uh, I think I'm going oh. to come, come out of the share. Oh, no. I've got, there's a, oh, I've got there's it. a comment. I just want to say there's a comment from Daniel. It says, I really like the multi painting on Hounds of Death canvas or street arts and on lockdown blues. So he really likes those paintings. Thank you, Thank you um, so much, Daniel. Uh, and I'm there'll be a sure. recording of this. But there's another question about the recording. We're going to put the recording out. Um, um, so so just email me to get the link or I'll try and get it out um, on the different channels that you have the recording of this. Can people see that? Can you see that, Lala? No, I'm just seeing you, a big picture oh, of you. Oh, you're just seeing me now. So we've come out of the share. Right. Um, one second then. I have to go back into the share. Is that now sharing? Oh uh, yes, we're just yeah. seeing your your screen. Oh, That's it. You're Great. seeing got the, the Diana. Is that yeah, the tissue? There we are. This is Beautiful. a tissue painting. So yeah. And and is that the one above the Kokoschka painting? And that's the Kokoschka painting. Yeah, I love that yeah. one too. Yeah. So. Oh, I see, and it's even been flipped from your picture. No, no, no it's oh, just. Right. It's just the colour. Really? I thought the houses were on the other side. No, no. Gosh, OK, yeah. it's been yeah, flipped in my mind. It's, it's a bit difficult for me to go click from one to the other. Yeah, it's OK, it's OK. Yeah, okay. but you have to um, remember them. So wait a minute. So that's, yeah, 
uh, and then these are the originals of the. They're called Elegies for Street Life, the second series, and these yeah. were just street scenes. And these were pictures. These were some of the very first paintings I did of street life in London. And again, each of these paintings. There's the one you remember the one with the bus with the sort of pool of wet paint going over it. This was the original for it. Oh, wow. And yeah. So. Uh, this one. Her, there's this very bright light and you get this really, really dark. Black shadows coming across the image in in the reverse version, which is quite spooky and ominous. And that one. That one worked really well. Not all images work well when you invert them. And this is the one that I said becomes really, really anxious. Um, yes, I remember that one because they yeah. look miserable, really down and miserable in the inverted one. But you see what I mean as well? They come so much more to life as people in the in the positive version and something gets lost when you invert. They also, it reminds me of when the bombs dropped, you know, in the apocalypse and this, you just suddenly think you might, people might you get a flash of people skeletons or something like that, you know. <laughs> this is another one that got. Um, yes, yes. In, inverted uh, and this one. And this yes. one, I just took this very top corner and it's very it's interesting because in the original photograph, I wish I could get rid of this thing at the top. Sorry, it doesn't want to. I don't know how to get rid of that. What? Yeah. We can't see it. I don't you think. can't see it anyway. Oh, that's good. There's a black bar. Yeah. You can't see it. Oh, well, in the original painting, you can almost see she's been painting out because in the photograph, sorry, there was a second woman with oh, right. a mother and child here. And in this image, she, I didn't need, she didn't need her. It was all, it was better without her. So I painted her out. But then when I came to do the reverse version, I just chose this section and it became about the two women. And so both were, both of the women are in the reverse version. Yes, I remember the yes, the reverse one, because the push chair looks amazing, you know, in, yeah. inverted. Yeah. Yeah, the push chairs. And this yeah, is, I remember that one. This is the one that's on the poster. The one that's the lockdown. No, this is that's so different. See what I mean, isn't it? Yeah, isn't the it? blues. Is that the lockdown blues? That's wow. Lockdown blues. Yeah. Oh, it's because there's so much blue in it in the inverted one as well. Yeah. yeah. So it's quite, it's really. It's very powerful, very powerful. Yeah. And then this one. Oh, I haven't shown I haven't shown you this painting. There's a painting called Last Time I Saw My Friends in Brussels. And um, these are this is um, Valerie Lala knows and Andrea yep. and our friend Sylvia, who I think you also know, Lala. I do know. And I know uh, uh, I, I know and, them all. They're my friends. <laughs> yeah, yes, they are. Well, and Ed I put Edith into the painting because Edith was there, but she was she must have been taking the photo or something. Um, so and the image that I painted of it is in the reverse colours. And th this is one of the things that's, again, slightly philosophical thought about this. In this image, you can see it's in the night time. When you look at the inverted image. You once you're told, you know, it's in the night time, so you have your rational knowledge about it. But when you actually look at the inverted image that your perception is not telling you that. And that's something that's so interesting to me, how painting deals with perception. It doesn't deal with what we know. It deals with our, our, our senses. And it really, this, this image in when it's painted, and I'll see if I can clip back to it. Is it possible to do that? Um, uh, Sorry about this. Going. We've got um, some more comments coming in. OK, um, while, I'm, while I'm just doing this. Yeah, while you're doing that, we've got a comment from Gabs, which says, I do believe that looking at the negative is very interesting since it's almost like digging deeper into the surface of something that is in plain sight. That's a good oh, comment. 
Very nice. I'd love to remember that. <laughs> Thank well, you. Well, I'll give you the recording, then you can yes. re read it off. <laughs> yes. But it's in your chat anyway. Yes. Thank you. And this this is the painting. So you see what I mean? If I didn't tell you, honestly, would you say that these dark marks here are bright street lights and this is a night sky and this is a night scene? Yeah, no, no. no. It's um, so and now you know it. You've got a battle going on between what you know and what you see. It's fascinating. I'm absolutely so fascinated by it. Anyway, you can see there's Edith. I've added Edith in. Oh, yes, I see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I think it's a good point to to round up here because um, we've run out of time and literally um, it's a one hour and that's it. The, it ends. But, um, um, you know, we've got more people saying I'd, I'd inverted. Kirsty says I'd inverted the way they were looking at this. So, wow, really different. Hard to imagine, isn't it? So you've got some nice comments and, um, um, you know, just want to really thank you for being so generous and sharing your work today. Um, there's I mean, we'll follow you. I'll, I'll put out when you have do invite us, send the invites to the Sheffield exhibition. Um, you know, we might organise a posse from Leicester. Oh, wow, Sheffield. that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. So keep keep in touch with us and we'll definitely be going to be following your work. It's just, you know, there's something really in it. Um, Gabs is saying there's people saying thank you. And Gabs is also, is there any way we can contact you for more more questions? Have you got a question now, Gabs, the last one that you want to say before we close up? Uh, She's just typing. Um, yeah, it's based on curation. Do you want to turn on your camera and just quickly do your last question before we go? Or turn on your and ask you a question. Yeah, yeah, that's OK. Sorry, I was Thanks, just setting yeah. it up. So, um, yeah, I just um, I wanted to know, like, because I was considering curation as a sort of like future for me I was just thinking can curation be like based off of your like personal opinion I know like when you have work in front of you you've kind of got to place it out in terms of what really works but can you can you like sometimes feel like your personal opinion can kind of affect like <laughs> where what where like certain works are supposed to go <laughs> you see what I mean I I'd say, I'd say to you, your personal opinion is the most important thing. In yeah. <laughs> creating, um, it's absolutely the starting point. That's where you start. Yeah. I mean, what 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 matters to you, what you care about, that's your starting point. So, completely, where um, I mean, this that's that's what being an artist is all about. It's <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and that, and it is, and it's, uh, I mean, it's a process of understanding for yourself and self-reflection and working out for yourself what you really feel and think. Um, yeah, okay. And, and the process Thanks. of doing, doing it, you get to know more about, I mean, I, I haven't communicated just the sense of anxiety I had when I first presented these paintings. I had no idea how people were going to respond to them. They felt a complete break for me. I was I was in a very psychologically vulnerable state after because um, of what had been happening over the last 18 months. So, yeah, but you've always got to start from where you are. Yeah. OK, thanks. <laughs> oh, that's a good question anyway. Um, thank you very much and thank you all. And um, um, well, you can all it's time to round up so you can, um, you know, just say big thank you to um, you know Trevor. You've really made our day coming. So um, well, huge thank you to you, Lala, for inviting.